strip the earth of all its resources just because God made us a number one, right? USA, USA. Um, all right, that's, that's preposterous. I mean, you might as well just try to win an argument in high school by wearing the right pair of sneakers, right? That's, there's no enlightenment thinking at all going on there. So, uh, so forget wise use, all right? So that leaves us with economic arguments, right? And utilitarian arguments that assume that humans are a certain way. Humans are naturally avaricious, naturally uh, pleasure and wealth seeking, power seeking, and their behavior can't be helped. And if we don't build this new energy infrastructure, then it'll be built in some other country, and it's better to provide the benefits over here, and we're gonna do it more safely and more responsibly and more, with more, greater respect for the environment, et cetera, et cetera, right? So if you assume all that, if you go traipsing down the serpent windings of utilitarianism far enough, then their argument seems quite appealing, doesn't it? Doesn't it? All right. You're supposed to say, shout back resoundingly, no, it doesn't sound appealing at all. But uh, anyway, all right, so, so that's what I want to try to consider, and let's just try to reconstruct, right? And, and you need to, in order to understand philosophy, you can't think about outcomes. All the views we're going to go over now are, are going to be views that reflect, uh, that, that, that views that, that lead to a rejection. They, you know, I mean, and, and if we can't understand how each of the traditions we've looked at is going to respond to a proposal like this, then we probably totally missed, missed the boat, right? But, and, and I'm, but I'm also encouraging you to think more deeply about the nature of value. Um, and, and now we're kind of done with all that, though. We're kind of done with the meta-ethical section of our journey. Uh, thanks to Thomas Birch, who's kind of led us out of the wilderness, so to speak. Um, but anyway, all right, so let's get into our, uh, I don't have any other lecture slides for today. I just have my little um, natural resource values wheel. All right, so we don't need that anymore either. Okay, um, so Birch's point is that um, the effort to base to found natural resource policy on an identification of moral status is part of an imperialistic project uh, that we would be better off moving away from rather than embracing. Um, and in his other essay, he talks about wilderness areas themselves as being uh, manifestations of empire's uh, insistence on imposing the law on everything. Okay, I know that, that sounds a bit odd. Anyway, um, but perhaps we need to start thinking about all of these different traditions as being part of an ecology of environmental ethics. Perhaps, perhaps just as there is uh, incredible and wondrous and awe-inspiring diversity in life forms on the planet Earth and in ecosystems and landscapes, right? It's just breathtaking to behold how much diversity there is, right? The richness of life is really, really amazing. And sh should it be a surprise that our minds are limited uh, and, that, and that our thinking about nature and the value of natural resources Perhaps it makes sense that is going, you know, that thinking is going to be equally diverse. And rather than trying to pin oneself down, the environmental ethicist perhaps ought to be uh, drawing connections between all these different kinds of values, right? Uh, and not, not saying, okay, the one true value, like Rolston says, right? The one true value that we need to orient our natural resource policy around is the intrinsic value of an ecological whole. Right? Um, this is very practically minded, and that's what Thomas Birch is saying too. He's saying that our attribution of moral status onto any entity is always, um, is always the result of just giving it careful attention. Right? And, and there's a sense in which giving an entity careful attention itself 
involves giving, you know, regarding it morally, giving it moral consideration. And potentially everything is worthy of moral consideration, okay? Thomas Birch points that out. Even a rock, right? I thought of, he has his example of rock climbing, right? Of climbing that pitch, that whatever he calls it, that rock climbing. Anyway, but I have an example when I was on, on Isle Royal, where they have these little fumaroles of gases that erupt from, from and we walked out a little ways on, it was really cold, um, and to the lake, you know, just you know, a little ways where it's real shallow. And, and, and our, guy, our, our tour guides were pointing out these fumaroles. And there were these rocks and these little critters that live there, right? And if you move one of those rocks around the fumarole, then everything changes and the little critters that had their little home in there changes. And so, even though a rock, right, is inanimate, there's a sense in which when you're there on Isle Royal, you feel like those rocks have moral status because you know that they're little, tiny little ecosystems. They're part of tiny little ecosystems that little, little critters depend on, right? And so, the little critters might have moral status and then the rocks, though, they might not have direct moral status, but at least they have indirect moral status, right? And so our minds, Thomas Birch is saying, our minds are naturally oriented toward identifying the deontic aspect of every one of our experiences, okay? And if you happen to be in a special place, like on Isle Royal, having an experience with these fumaroles at the edge of the lake and these rocks, you know, that's a situation where you're, de you know, where a, de a duty, right? A sense that you have to act, you, want, you must do a certain thing, you must put that rock back, right? After you examined it, looked at it on the other side, you know, stuff, put it back right where it was. Um, so, you know, and that's, that's unusual, but, um, but uh, we do these kinds of things all the time in our daily lives. And there's not, it doesn't make sense to try to pin them down, right? Try to, it's better to connect them, to connect all the different kinds. And so, this is, an, this is a chart of the various kinds of experiences of value we might have in nature. Okay? And, perha and perhaps there's even a normative guideline, uh, just a practical normative guideline that a culture, a society, which expands the possibility of deontic experience, by, for example, making these kinds of exotic, the exotic experiences of value available is better than a society which shuts them off, right? For two or three hundred years, Western culture has put all of the weight on these experiences of value, right? And it's only the result of ecology and biology that have expanded the range of experience of value that humans can have, right? And so rather than, you know, saying, well, we need to stop, you know, stop emphasizing this, it's better to argue that it's, it's, it's all part of a balance. <clears throat> anyway, um, I have never assigned this reading, actually, to my class before, and I've certainly never lectured on it before. It always takes me a while to, uh, to fit new material in. Um, so things might be a little bit sketchy today. But let's see if we can um, do some review. All right? Um, I don't need this thing anymore at all. All right. Um, so, why is Tesoro Savage? Well, first of all, where might Tesoro Savage be a morally obligatory course of action? All right? How do we defend? It's going to be all in through here. The nihilists, obviously, is all moral judgments are equally valid, you know, and it's just a matter of taste. And you got these wacko environmentalists who love the penguins and the salmon, and then, you know, but their their moral judgment has no more. That's obviously a, a, a very easy move to make. Simply insist that meta-ethically, right? And this is the move that Baxter makes. This is the move that Norton makes. There is no possibility of experience of non-anthropocentric value, right? Start out with that blanket metaphysical claim. And then you're stuck in anthroland, like Baxter says, we're stuck in, right? Baxter says it's all up to humans. Some humans like to have a clean Walden pond. Some humans like to have penguins that aren't contaminated with DDT. Other humans would prefer to spend the money that we'd have to spend to clean up Walden pond and get rid of the DDT to save the penguins but prefer to spend that money on hospitals and social programs and schools and stuff like that, right? And ultimately, the decision has got to be made by human beings on human-centered grounds, right? Um, 
Right? That would be one move that a Tesoro Savage defender could make, right? Right off the bat. Just all this, you know, to hell with that hippy-dippy stuff. I'm not admitting that. The, you know, metaphysically, those are questionable metaphysical commitments. That's what Norton says too, right? That's what Wilson says. Those are all questionable metaphysical commitments, and I'm just rejecting those. Those are no basis to carry on a dialogue, right? We can't carry on a dialogue about, you know, about things that, about metaphysically suspect concepts, like the intrinsic value of a salmon run, right? Or the Snake River has intrinsic value left to be left alone, right? It has rights to be left alone. Let it run wild again, right? And that's just, come on, man. Ultimately, we've got to decide among different competing human claims, right? Either on a utilitarian ground, which is largely Baxter's argument, he's mostly utilitarian, but that spheres of freedom argument kind of sounds like a Kantian argument, too. So anyway, you'll find your Tesoro Savage defenders all in through here, different kinds, right? The wise users are down here, right? USA, USA, humanity, humanity, we're number one, right? Uh, the neo-Kantian spheres of freedom argument, uh, virtue ethicists, right? Hey man, the frackers that are working in the frack fields in North Dakota, they're honorably, they're honorable, damn it. Sure, they got a little alcohol problem now and then, but they're sending money back to their families, right? They're supporting their kids, right? That's virtuous. They're making sacrifices, you know, to better their children's lives. That's wonderful. And then the neo-humans, of course, we owe obligations to each other, right? And then the utilitarians, especially if they just go with the economic analysis, the E is the egoist, right? Don't get that mixed up with economist. E is the egoist. And the egoist just says, the morally right thing to do is that which satisfies my deepest desires, right? Which, of course, is a morally bankrupt position, but it's coherent. Both nihilism and egoism are coherent, which is why I insist on putting them up there. But this is where you're going to find all the defenders in different forms, right? But you're also going to find opponents citing these same arguments, right? The Kantians. Uh, you know, all the children that are going to be affected by this they deserve. They are embodied and they are interrelated. And we know, thanks to biology and ecology, we know that little kids need clean water, clean land, clean air, and healthy biodiversity in order to grow up and manifest their humanity, right? To flower as human beings, to develop their, all their human, beautiful human attributes that they have, right? To become artists and ballerinas, you know, and, and philosophers and scientists, right? We need a healthy environment, okay? So a good Kantian says, no, no, these other things, you know, a classical Kantian, right? Not, a, not a, some of these fancy neo-Kantians that you see way over here or like Reagan way over here, right? But a classical Kantian can just say, all these other things have indirect value and they're very important, right? An enlightened person does not go around doing things. An enlightened society doesn't do things that, that, that harm the, the integrity or stability of their ecological holes that they depend on, right? But that's not because the ecological holes have any kind of intrinsic value or moral status, right? We're the ones, you know, little Billy and Emily and Susie and John and Thomas, they're the ones that have moral status, and yet they need those environments to be healthy, right? And they need biodiversity to grow up and experience these things, right? Not just see them on some ancient history channel. Right? So there's a very strong, neo, uh, very strong classical Kantian and neo-Kantian argument for opposing to Soros Savage. Right? And then the utilitarians, again, same deal. Right? Same deal. We can't, I mean, what, what kind of an enlightened society operates on a rule that, that's, that says we've got to continue ramping up production, consumption of fossil fuels? Knowing what we know. Come on, what kind of... That's a crazy rule to go by. And the econo and our emphasis on economic, you know, on the economy just needs to change. We need to adapt our economy to the ecology, right? And then the neo-humans, uh, you know, we have, we have sentiments. Uh, our hearts go out to people when they're suffering. And when we see people suffering, for example, from climate change, our hearts go out to them. And now we have all this technology and we can see what's happening to those people in the Philippines that are getting wiped out every year by these giant typhoons that are unprecedented in, in size and power, right? So our hearts go out to them. And we need to help them as a community, right? Um, so, Right? So we need to put a stop to this to Soros Savage. They're, they're having a hard enough time already. Right? And then the natural law theorists, well, old Pope Francis, 
You know, he, he could be here, he could be here, you know, with, with his uh, namesake, with St. Francis, right? He could be down here with, with, the bio, with the, either the biocentrist or, and then Pope Francis could probably be over here. He's also a holistic anthro. And Pope, because, right, because he's NLT. So these NLTs can actually be anywhere. That's what's interesting. And maybe the U's can be too. The D's obviously can be everywhere if you, if you accept, right? The D's need something. They need some basis for identifying moral status. And if you're willing to go with, with for example, Rolston's idea that anything that has storied achievement or positive creativity has moral status, well, then there you go. You've got a deontological argument. If you're reducing that thing that has moral status to, a, to nothing more than a means, right? It ha it's an end in itself, right? If you reduce it to nothing more than a means, well, you're violating the rule, right? You're being irrational. Only an irrational person would do that, right? Very strong. So the Ds appear all over the place, uh, or the Kantians and the Neo-Kantians. They appear, and the NLTs do too, of course. There's John Muir up there. I don't know who's, well, that could be Pope Francis. Um, anyway, so you see how all, all that works, right? And what I hope that all of you can do, rather than just jumping, the, the conclusion's fairly obvious because I, I teach these traditions distinct enough that you can see how they are oriented towards certain kinds of resolutions of moral struggles, right? The, why, the strongly anthro NLTs, the wise users, are pretty strongly oriented toward approving to Sorrow Savage, right? And, and they're oriented toward leaving the dams in place. They're oriented toward, you know, all kinds of fracking, drilling, every kind of exploitive behavior you can imagine they're in favor of. Um, anyway, so, but I'm hoping that you can, that obviously the goal of a philosophy class is not just to identify traditions and be able to connect them with policy alternatives, right? Policy options. The goal is to understand how the different traditions would explain their defense of a policy, right? I mean, a, a group A conservationist is going to have a very different sort of answer he, they both might, not a different answer, but a very different explanation, right? The group A conservationists and the group B conservationists might very well reach the same conclusion that Tesoro Savage is morally uh, totally unjustifiable and just needs to be stopped, um, right? But they're reaching that conclusion for very different reasons, okay? And the theory of value that they bring with them is different in each case. Right? And that's what I'm hoping you're, you're, you're developing an ability to explain to me as you do your written work. Um, all right. Uh, so, uh, what happens when we start plugging each of these? And, and this, by the way, has been, I haven't used this word, but um, I'm, not, I'm not sure if Thomas Birch uses it either, but there's a term that's used quite a bit, which is kind of helpful, uh, moral extensionism. And uh, one point that Thomas Birch is making is that simply exporting one of these traditions and finding a way to make it fit over here is an instance of moral extensionism. And when you do that, you're importing a whole range of metaphysical assumptions and a whole bunch of baggage that maybe when you really just sit down and try to understand the experience of, of, of value in anything in an old growth forest in you know, a salmon run etc maybe it's not wise to do this moral extensionism to import maybe we need a whole fresh start right but anyway uh, singer's defense of animal welfare is an example of moral extensionism, right? Sing, well, Singer would be way over here somewhere, right? Sing, the utilitarian defense of animal welfare ethics, right? Would be an example of moral extensionism. And maybe, our, you know, maybe that ignores too much, right? You're just, you're, you're importing too much of something that doesn't quite fit, right? Maybe there's not enough love, for example. Maybe there's no, there's no explanation of the love that I feel and that Roy feels for me, right? That, that helps explain why I think Roy has moral status. 
There's a lot more going on, in other words, right? And so maybe this moral extensionism stuff, we need to be very wary of that and be very careful. And maybe Collicut is one of the biggest culprits of all, right? Because he wants to do this moral extensionism and try to extend David Hume over there. So Thomas Birch just wants to step back and try to identify something common to all of these different experiences of value. And the one common element he finds to them is an element of experience, right? He's a pragmatist, by the way. I would, I would put Thomas Birch, he is hard to categorize. And when I talked to him on the phone, he did not mention the American pragmatists. But I'm sure he's read them and he's very familiar with them. But uh, he comes from more of a, a, a Buddhist, uh, a Buddhist, but also there's this postmodern, post enlightenment. He draws from these, these uh, 20th century continental thinkers. Um, but really, what he's doing is returning to experience, which is why I'm happy to read him as, an, as a pragmatist. He's trying to return to experience and trying to account for our experiences of value in nature and our experiences of, of we must do this, right? Of obligation. That's the root of obligation. And I, am, I experience some chagrin and regret when I notice that uh, he gives us the original definition of Dion, of Dion, right? There is no word, evidently, is what Thomas Birch claims. There's no word for duty in Greek. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm good with that. That's, the Greeks are always held up, even though they had all kinds of infirmities in their culture. You know, they had slavery and all kinds of inequality, economic inequality, and just, you know, there were some pretty bad conditions in their society, but they're still always held up, by, almost always, by historians and philosophers as an example of a, of a culture um, uh, that was just considerably more um, exalted and enlightened than our own. Uh, and of course, their big gift to philosophy is virtue ethics, and we'll get to that near the end of the term. Um, but there's a strong sense in which, in which uh, Birch is also offering us a virtue ethics argument, because um, what he's saying is that we need to pay attention to, uh, to the experience of value in nature and, and those character traits which lead us to a broader range of experience of value in nature are good character traits. They're positive. And those are the ones we should try to cultivate in ourselves, right? So kind of Birch gives us these character norms and he also gives us action norms. I think. But the character norms are more obvious, I think, is what he... Anyway, we're kind of, uh, we're up against our break, okay? We're a little bit late, so let's take about a, let's just come back at five minutes after one, all right? And take about a seven or eight minute break. And then we'll uh, try it, and then we'll start, we'll start plugging in these different theories and we'll show how, how moral extensionism really changes the traditions quite dramatically. <clears throat> I try to remember to get this down. I'm going to set it right over here. So when you come back, you can take it and just run around.
Tiny packets of energy. Interesting. You know, the Greeks might disagree with that. Of course, you might say, well, what did they know? But, uh, it's a, you know, it's a, when you get down to that level, right? When you, how do we describe this, right? This is a uniquely uh, Western scientific conceptualization, perhaps, of, 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 of the, the tiniest, you know, particles of, of everything. Um, but perhaps the claim that uh, tiny packets of beauty, the Greeks would, would, would be more inclined toward, you know, describing the ultimate stuff of the universe as tiny, tiny particles of beauty, or packets of beauty rather than packets of energy. But they're onto the same idea, right, that, that, that matter somehow miraculously organizes itself uh, and holds itself together. Uh, so, but, um, but the Greeks would, you know, they, and they, they, they believed that there was beauty um, not only physically, but in character. That the, the beauty of a character uh, is predicated on the same elements as the beauty of a form, the beauty of a, of a painting or a, or a sculpture uh, or a, a sunset or a forest. Uh, the beauty of a character, so too, is, is, uh, is held together by um, these little particles of, of yeah, I'm assuming, you know, particles of beauty, but held together by, uh, <clears throat> you know, the same thing that, that holds a beautiful sculpture that, that, that tells, you know, that, that pulls at us, right? Or, or a melody. Can any old combination of tones invoke a pleasing sensation of, you know, like when you listen to Paco Bell's Canon in D or something, right? It's incredibly pleasing. Uh, so there seems to be a, a certain um, intrinsic orderliness to the universe. And what virtue ethics has taught us since the ancient times is that there's also an intrinsic order of character of, of, of Maybe just think of it as management of your emotional intensities, management of your sentiments. There's a way of organizing your sentiments, of working on yourself, that is more consistent with the intrinsic orderliness of the universe, and which therefore, moreover, leads to excellence of character, and excellence of character goes hand in hand with happiness, with sustained happiness, not just random, you know, go out and get drunk and, you know, have wild times, but sustained enjoyment.